Welcome back, everyone, once again to a brand new installment of Screenplay Rewind. I'm Jeff. I'm Ron. And we were just talking in the green room about how what a wonderful double feature Mitchell's vs. the Machines and the Book <laughs> of Eli is. You're welcome, America. They're both post uh, post apocalyptic. I can't say the word. It's going to be a great episode. <laughs> Are you drinking? No, I'm drinking Coke Zero. I'm drinking a little bit, but not enough to get. I should probably drink more. It make for probably a better <laughs> podcast. I, I should probably drink more. I think people listening to us should probably drink more, too. That's probably just a good rule of thumb, you know? I think people that listen to us do drink more. That's how they get through it. I know. What was it? Like, we found out, like, five people we were their most listened to podcast. I'm sorry. Like, that's just <laughs> unfortunate for everybody. Those people... So uh, sorry. Those people just drink so heavily they pass out, but their <laughs> podcast player just keeps going. So, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, they, they, just, they just sleep right through us. <laughs> Oh man! So when's the last time you watched Book of Eli? Just out of curiosity, because I realized when I started it up, it had been several years to the point to where I remembered like the major gist of it, but not like all the fine details of it. I'm gonna say being generous, probably like 2014 ish. Yeah, something like that, because it came out in 2010. 12 years ago, bro. I know. Fuck me, dude. Jesus. And that's the year I got married. So sometime after it came out on like DVD is when I would have watched it with Chris. I just... Sometime between like 2011 and 2014 is probably the last time I saw it. Just fucking nuts. Just before we forget about this, this is probably one of the most... Like, watch the movie if you care about spoilers because... There is a spoiler in this that just completely redefines like the entire fucking movie, which is really cool to say about a post-apocalyptic action movie. You know, yes. how, how often do you have in a post-apocalyptic action movie a twist that totally redefines like the way that you watch the movie? It's really cool. It's really rare too. Yeah, it's it's so good, and you really, really should watch the movie before listening to us talk about it because if we're gonna go into full spoilers and. It's just, it would be such a waste if you listen to this first, because yeah. it's, it's going to be something that you can't get back. It's going to, you're going to lose exactly. an experience watching this movie that you just cannot get back. Yeah, exactly. And before we start the show, uh, we don't think we had any questions this week, but if you do ever want to have the show open up with a question or prompt uh, for Ron and myself, uh, be sure to email us screenplayrewind at gmail.com. You can also tweet us a uh, question uh, at SPR filmcast. You can probably reach us over dms or just an at you know we'll check it out and put it on the show so we'd really appreciate it okay i'm gonna do the rundown real quick directors for the book of eli and again please have watched the movie if you care about spoilers because we're going to be going into full detail just like ron had stated the directors are albert and alan hughes uh they typically are referred to in credits as the hughes brothers they haven't directed as much as i would have liked to have seen them direct uh because it's this movie and From Hell, which I think are probably their two most notable works. And I really like both of those movies. So I yeah. wish they were able to do more. They are apparently uh, lead directors of the Continental John Wick TV show, which I'm very excited about because I've been waiting for that show for years. And it's such a good concept for a show. You can which, do anything is, with. which you watch this and you can see why. Yeah. You can absolutely. And between this and, between this and From Hell... I love their visual style. It's so distinct. You know, like they're they're distinct in very different ways, but they they always have like a very very specific like visual language for the movie. You know. Yep. Yeah. It uh, Book of Eli confirmed invented Instagram filters. Pretty much. Yeah. This this movie somehow looks more Mad Max than Mad Max Fury Road, which is really crazy. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Oh, that's a movie uh, we need to cover. Yeah, it's actually kind of a shame that we've almost hit 50 episodes and haven't covered Fury Road. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? The writer for the film, Book of Eli, Gary Whitta, which was something that you uh, mentioned that you actually did not recall him being the writer for. I somehow knew he was because he's friends with a couple of different podcasters that you and I both follow. I, you said he was buddies with uh, Not That Will Smith. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that I uh, also... when I saw that name come up, I was like, excuse me? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's really wild that he he wrote this. And he's like the sole credited writer for it, so it's just him. It's, it's, this is his uh, second... No, this is actually his first fucking film script that was turned into a film. Isn't that crazy, your first movie being Book of Eli? 
man. Because he he wrote the screenplays for the Back to the Future Part Two and Prey video games back in 1990 and 2006, and his first movie, Book of Eli. Crazy. Damn. Yeah. He, I think he's. Uh, I think the podcaster that I know him from is. Uh, I think he's friends with Cargill as well. I think Cargill has sense. talked about. Uh, just because you know he fucking knows everyone in Hollywood pretty much. Pretty much. But yeah, uh, starring Mila Kunis, Denzel. Uh, yeah. I mean, anytime I hear Mila Kunis's voice, I think "Shut up, Meg." But anytime, <laughs> anytime I see her, I think of that moment in Extract. When she's looking at the newspaper and her eyes are flicking back and forth between the dude like losing his balls in an industrial accident <laughs> and whatever the the ad was, I really like uh, it. I mean, obviously it's not Office Space, but I actually really liked Extract. I uh, volunteered to screen Extract, and I was the only one that wanted to see it, and I got paid to watch that movie, and it was fucking I liked awesome. That. I, I, liked I, I that really movie. liked that movie. I, I think love that movie good. so much. I think that'd be a good one to uh, cover for the show sometime because you know it's it's a very I think I think you me and Mike Judge are the only <laughs> three people in the world that watch that movie. It's kind of sad. But you know what I'm talking about? The scene when she's in her car at the newspaper and it's got the dramatic music and it keeps flipping yeah, between so. her and the paper and it's like a more dramatic zoom in each time. <laughs> That's what I, I think vague, of every I, yeah. time I see her. I can totally see that. Great movie. <laughs> I need I need to. Uh, I would love that an excuse to watch it again because I only did see it the one time on like uh like fucking. Netflix or something at some point. Oh, it's so good. Uh, Gary Oldman Damn right. playing the eccentric villain because fuck yes. Oh my god. I love did you remember Ray so Stevenson being in this movie? I, I had did no not. clue. When, I... when Ray Stevenson is like the number one henchman, I was like, no shit, because I completely forgot. But this is like season. the most normal I'm used to seeing him. So like I heard his voice and then got to looking at his eyes and I had to IMDb him because I'm used to looking at him like he looks like in Thor, right? Like I'm yeah. used to seeing him and like crazy stuff. And I was just did like, holy shit, that's Ray Stevenson. Did you ever see Punisher War Zone with him as the Punisher? No, but I did not know he was Frank Castle. If I had known, I, I own that movie. Someone bought it for me and I've never watched it. You are going to fucking love that movie because it doesn't take itself seriously, but at all. But Ray Stevenson is playing it completely straight as Frank Castle, and the movie is just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like, it is by no means good, but it is amazing, <laughs> if you get what I mean. Because Ray Stevenson is just playing it fucking straight. Like, he's in a fucking MCU film, like, an, like a like, legit adaptation of it, while everyone else is just having fun with it, and it's such, like, a genius combination of it. Nice. It's great. We should have that. We should have that on the podcast and be drinking while we both watch it and cover the episode for it. Ray, Ray Stevenson needs to be in more stuff, man. Yeah, he's awesome, and he's another. He's another just like real unsung hero. I wish he uh, had bigger role in Thor. He's a little bit like uh, we were just talking about in the green room, Carl Urban. You know, like yeah. not enough people appreciate those two. This is like these guys are fucking great, but they just never seem to get a break. You know, it's like the one time he gets like a leading role is Punisher War Zone. But the movie is literally <laughs> the movie is literally a fucking meme. So he can't, you know, even, even though he's fucking awesome in the movie, like, there's no, like, career traction. Uh, he's apparently Porthos in the 2011 Three yes. Musketeers movie. Yes. Is he, is he, I'm assuming he's good. I actually haven't seen that movie, though. Porthos it, being a former pirate is, like, my favorite character. And in my favorite adaptation, that's Oliver Platt, one of my favorite actors. Of course. And in that one, it's Ray Stevenson. And, oh, my God, he's so good. Nice. He's so good as Porthos. Because Porthos is... Like, you know, the the less, like, uptight of all the Three Musketeers, because he's a former pirate. Uh -huh. Like, he boozes it up and womanizes and stuff. So it's Ray Stevenson kind of in a slightly different role than you're kind of used to seeing him. Uh -huh. um, but, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, that movie's not particularly great, but I still enjoy watching it. Yeah, I would like to watch it, because I, I really like the... I think that's the it one with the airship. I'm not sure. Okay. I don't uh, remember. There's so many. I've seen so many Musketeers movies because there's like The Musketeer, and then there's The Three Musketeers, I think, came after. Uh, and then wasn't uh, Man in the Iron Mask also a Three Musketeers movie, just not called that way? I don't know. I've never seen it, actually. I think it was. I think it was. But yeah, the movie has been, re the movie's been <laughs> redone so many fucking times. But the Disney one is still my favorite. Is that the one with Charlie Sheen and Oliver Platt? It's Oliver Platt, Charlie Sheen, um, Chris O'Donnell, Kiefer Sutherland. Is that uh, like 
such a fucking 90s cast that i love it <laughs> michael like, wincott uh, tim curry great casts oh dude the cast in that movie alone we're gonna cover that sometime it's on my list because i'm surprised I've you haven't picked it yet to be honest because and you that was one of the it's coming wasn't that a movie that you had selected we watched but like uh just on like a movie day that ended up pretty much becoming this podcast i found it on dvd and i was stunned because i owned it on vhs but i left all my vhs's at my parents house but i found it on dvd and i bought it but i was afraid to watch it because i was afraid it wasn't going to hold up to the way i remember it and i was talking to you about it and i was like here you you just take this and you go watch this you watch it and you understand where pirates of the caribbean came from <laughs> And you went and you watched it, and you're like, no, dude, it holds up. You need to it watch totally it. Does. It so, totally does. So I went back and watched it. I was like, oh, thank God, it's just as great as I remember it being. It's so good. Because I watched it's, the fuck out of that VHS tape as a kid, dude. That jacket is worn out from getting the tape in and out of it so much. And, and uh, you know, just Tim Curry and Michael Wincott, everyone else after those two names is just a cherry on top, because I would Tim, watch any movie with those two alone. Yeah, Tim Curry is Cardinal Richlow, dude. Like, holy shit, what perfect casting is that? Yeah, absolutely fucking love it. And then Michael Wincott is a uh, Rochefort, and that is absolutely... I think of him... I think of Rochefort every time I see Michael Wincott. Whether I'm watching, you know, Alien Resurrection or what, I think of Rochefort. Also, Rochefort. kudos to you Isn't for that actually... is a smelly kind of a cheat? Kudos to you for actually remembering their character names. <laughs> because, like, that just... I, I would have been uh, just executed immediately if my life depended on You know, on sadly, I can never names. remember all three of them. I know D'Artagnan, obviously, but Porthos, Aramis, and I can never remember yeah. the other one. And I should, after reading the story and watching that movie so much and watching every adaptation I can get my hands on of it, you would think yeah. I would know all three of the Musketeers, but Porthos, Aramis, and... Blah. Athos. 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 And I think that go. one's Kiefer Sutherland, right? And Aramis. That is, is correct, yeah. Ar Aramis is Charlie Sheen. Kiefer Sutherland is Athos. Right. Chris O'Donnell is D'Artagnan. And Oliver Platt is Portos. I like how this has just become a Three Musketeers <laughs> super fan <laughs> <Right>. podcast. <laughs> Dude. Oh, yeah. It Last wouldn't be Screenplay Rewind if it wasn't Screenplay Tangents. That should have right. been the name of the show. Screenplay, screenplay Tangents. Tangents. Much more accurate title. I mean, come on. D'Artagnan's fighting two guys. Porthos jumps down from the top of the ship. The two guys scream, yell, Porthos the pirate, and jump overboard from the ship without even fighting him. <laughs> and he's just like, pirate? And he's like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. I feel like that has been bumped up to probably one of your next like two or three choices you get. Yeah, it's, this, it, yeah. it, it's coming very soon. It, how, it's, many do you have on your, how many do you have on your short list for this show? Curiosity? Because I pretty, much end up, I pretty much end up picking the movie just on like a whim of like something that pops up in my brain of something I want to cover. Sometimes I have like, like a, we talked about the last time I picked a movie. Uh, I usually will sometimes have like two or three on my mind that I want to pick, but you seem to have like a legit list running at all times. My short list is not short and it's in no particular order. So like usually whatever's kind of next. Sure. But usually we'll talk about something or you'll pick a movie that makes me reorganize. Like I bump one up higher. True something so it's it's ever changing but I've, go. I've got a i have an i a running uh public listed imdb list of stuff i want to cover i should probably do that <laughs> i also have a well, list I, on imdb of ones we have covered and in order i just haven't updated it in a while well you showed a lot more initiative than i did because i don't <laughs> even have a list for myself but you know what we do it live fuck it so you want to talk about book of eli I was say, even why anyways why the movie. we talking about <laughs> So, Book of Eli, the uh, actual official prequel for Mitchells vs. the Machines. So, yep. we have a sequential series you know, ongoing. There you go. Or is Mitchells vs. the Machines the prequel? Oh, shit. So, the Machines did win. So, the Machines did win. Dude, Mitchells vs. the Machines? <laughs> That's the prequel for Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the prequel for Book of... <laughs> Cannibalism. Yummy, I'm good. Yummy, I'm good. <laughs> mm -mm, Kuru. <laughs> oh, man. Dude, B Book of Eli, though. Let's Seriously, talk this movie. It. Let's talk. Let's talk about the movie we came here to talk about. Yeah, you know, so. but real quick about Three Musketeers. <laughs> but real quick about Porthos. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, uh, dude, this movie. Um, I did not realize how much of this movie the Mandalorian was channeling. It really feels like Mandalorian. But... 
yeah you can really you can really put that because because this is almost like a western uh yeah. in fact wikipedia describes it as a neo-western yeah it's interesting and and this movie actually does like a lot of very interesting stuff with breaking like expectation like uh so the, let's talk about it real quick one the first thing i noticed was let's talk about the opening scene i think the opening scene in this movie is incredibly smart in like a subtle way uh, it so you completely know, sets you up for what you're in for in a way it's it's yeah it like it immediately establishes like tone the world and, and are you familiar with the writing term of saving the cat no so there's a term and i think it was actually there's actually a like a really well known writing novel called saving the cat that kind of describes like in detail certain writing tropes that are just kind of like industry uh, standards is this a gravity's rainbow situation where everybody likes the title but no one's read it uh sort of kind of like it's it's a, it's a well-known like uh, the, the book itself is not particularly i think uh followed but the gist of it is because when you think about it the the, the, the what the term comes from is saving the cat is a movie writing uh, and just fiction writing trope of within the first few pages of establishing your protagonist you have them uh what is called in the business like saving the cat and what it basically means is a random act of kindness that endears you to the main character so it it tells you a lot that the first thing they have Eli do is kill a cat. You know, they just completely throw yeah, they completely throw that trope on its head. Because when you think about it, like, what's one of the first things you see Superman do in Christopher Reeve's Superman? Literally save a fucking cat. Yeah, you know, it's always just some like little ran- random act of kindness. And when they have him like you know kill the cat just to be able to have dinner, and it's like really smart is uh, in that it establishes him as like this yeah. is not your typical protagonist. This it- is. A really fucked up situation when he literally has to kill a random cat just to be able to have dinner. No, he doesn't save the cat. He saves the rat with the cat. <laughs> true, true. And th- that is that is the save the cat moment when he when he takes the time to you know give a little bit of the meat to the rat and talks to it. It endears you a little bit to his character, showing you that he's kind of conflicted. So and the he, opening scene has its cake and eats it too, along with exactly. the cat. Exactly. <laughs> yeah exactly it's incredibly smart because it shows you just kind of like the struggle that he's having and another great moment is uh, later on when he sees the the two people getting attacked by the raiders and he really really wants to step in and help them but he can't because he is so fixated on what his mission is so he he, he has these like ideals you know he, he really wants to step in and save them but he is more concerned at that moment about what his you know true mission is so I think it just all like really smartly establishes him as a really interesting character because he's not doing he's not doing the Mad Max thing. You know, you know how like in the first two Mad Max movies, he always ends up, you know, like kind of trying to step in to help people. Right. That is not what he does initially. He has to kind of like get back on that track. And I think it's just really interesting, like um establishing him as a different type of protagonist. Uh, you know, he ends up becoming more of your pr- prototypical protagonist, but it also ties in with kind of like the message of the movie. So I think this movie, you know, on the surface, it's just like a really fucking cool looking post-apocalyptic horror movie. But, you know, you can kind of tell that it's written by Gary Whitta because there's a lot more like depth to it. Apparently I can't. It's just, um, I, I just find this movie like, especially on, on revisit, I find this movie like very interesting to kind of like break down what tropes. I see it that. Kind of, like, Are you, uh, Getting right out of the gate, throwing some writing writing uh, tactics at me. I've it's been a while since I've heard you break something down as a writer. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where like I actually appreciate this movie even more now. You know, just kind of like revisiting it, uh, and and specifically, you look at a movie differently when you're recording it for a podcast. You know, because right. you're 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 actively analyzing it, and yeah, I I just found like the opening of this movie like really really well done. Yeah, the thing that that I love is Eli is about. 15 degrees off of my favorite kind of protagonist, like you were talking about. Like, uh, Geralt is like the perfect example of the type of, of the type of protagonist that I love because like there's that, the one story in the book slash episode in the series where there's the two people being attacked and he just rides by on his horse and he's just like, not my problem, not mm-hmm. my problem. And then after a few more paces of the horse, he just goes, Ah, fuck. And then he turns his horse around and goes back. Yeah. <laughs> like the the kind of unwilling hero is kind of my favorite type of protagonist. 
And yeah. Eli in this is a, just about 15 degrees off of that. He's almost to that point. Like you're talking about when he was watching, what are they called? The hijackers? Yeah, um, typically. Yeah. When he was and watching them scene... attack, um, attack the two people. Yeah, and that scene is it's hard to watch because yeah, you know it is. they set it up too with the expectation in mind as that the viewer. Gonna oh, he's them. he's going to save them. He's the hero, but he's and, not. He specifically says, "Not you know, not my concern. Stay in the path." Mm-hmm. You know, and he, it, yeah, I was going to say this is placed, isn't it? Right after he takes out a whole group of people hijacking him. So you know that he clearly can handle not only himself, but handle a large group. Mm-hmm. And then the next group he runs across, just not my concern, stay on the path. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. You know, like they do a lot of, you know, things that kind of catch you off guard as the, the, you know, the viewer, because they're actively going against your expectations, but not in an annoying way. They're just establishing like the world. They're establishing how fucked up the situation is. And they're establishing, you know, that he is more concerned at this time with his mission than saving people, which is not your prototypical hero, especially in this kind of situation. Cause you know, usually when you see people, you know, getting attacked like that, Oh, obviously we're establishing the protagonist, but that is not the idea. The, the idea is to establish what he's more concerned about at that given time. Yeah. They, they linger on that scene for a while. So that you yeah, they, know <laughs> that you understand what kind of character Eli is. Yeah, um, there's another aspect to Eli though that I completely forgot existed in this movie, and What's that? that is his divine protection. Man, when he has that gunfight and he is just standing in the middle of the street and none of them can hit him, it's fucking awesome. One even uh, was it Ray Stevenson shoots through the hood on his hoodie, and still misses. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then like all of his shots connect. Yeah, and I, like, and I love that moment too at the end of that scene when Ray Stevenson is just looking at him and just like, you know, can't wrap his mind around what he's seeing because he can clearly tell that, you know, like they've shot at he, that point, he what, knows like he 30 should be bullets. Dead. Yeah. They've shot like at least 30 rounds at this guy in the middle of a street and only at the very end does he even bother to get behind cover. So clearly something is up. And Ray Stevenson just, you know, just can't even understand, like, he can't even comprehend like what he's looking at and he just lets him go. It's a cool moment. Yeah, it's really neat. Uh, what it kind of reminded me of when they started really leaning into that, like in that moment, is uh, what was that Bill Paxton movie that we watched? Uh, uh, what was it about? Um, he thinks he's on a divine mission killing demons and he's killing all these terrible people. And his oh, son frailty. thinks he's crazy. Yes. Frailty. Yeah. It kind of reminded another, another me of Another movie that, that I would bit. like to have on the show, actually. I think Frailty would be very interesting to talk about. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a good movie. I didn't even know it existed until we watched it. Um, but it kind of reminded me of that where it's like, you know, he, especially the more he talks about his mission later to Solara, and you're just like, is he crazy? Or, like, is it real? Because you've seen him do some shit that should not make sense. Like, you have seen this gunfight before he tells that story to Solara. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're just kind of like, uh like kind of like is he crazy or or not but the more the movie goes on like especially realize, later yeah. when he's when he's in nowhere with Eustace and Muriel <laughs> <laughs> dude, Eustace and Muriel got dark dude yeah they really did <laughs> how, how, how fucking, dude, there are so many small details in this movie of like world building and shit that I absolutely fucking love. How cool is the detail that they make them hold out their hands to check if they're cannibals because they're twitching if they've been eating human meat. Yes. Like that, that is like a next fucking level detail that as soon as they uh, had them do it, I was like, why would they be having to do that? And then they kind of confirm it later on, you know, by talking about how they noticed that they're cannibals because of their hands shaking with the tea. Kuru. It's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kuru, the uh, I love act it. of eating human meat specifically the brain you get infected with that fucking crazy dude yeah ask papa new guinea about that Um, and that's another that's another thing about this movie that i had forgotten about you know obviously it's a post-apocalyptic action movie and you think back to like some of like the the gory fight scenes when you know denzel just fucks people up but this just in the scenes that aren't actually action sequences like this movie is just like brutally dark so i'm glad you mentioned the gore part, because like I was talking with my wife after we watched it is it's amazing how 
dark and gory the movie is, but it never really shows you any gore at the same time. Yeah, everything is usually kind of silhouetted in some way. Like when he pass walks back underneath the overpass, and you just see in silhouette people's limbs flying off and stuff, and mm -hmm. um, heads being uh, removed surgically. We'll say uh, pretty much, but you never really. It's not like you know people's guts spilling out onto the road or anything. Yeah. So it's it's really kind of restrained in a way, but still and oh, I mean, I guess I said it earlier, it's it's eating its cake and having it too. It's it's gore without showing you the gore. There's not a and lot just of like movies the, that do that, and there's even fewer that do that well. And just like the um the way they go about it is very artistic too. Uh yeah. this the, my favorite se uh, sequence in the movie as far as like the fight scenes go is how cool is the shot where you see the action scene taking place underneath the uh, the overpass where it's just in silhouette against yeah. like the sky. That shot is so cool. And it's just like you said, you know, like you see him like, you know, like cutting their arms off and stuff, but it's just in shadow and it makes it, it just makes it really like it's, you know, it's still brutal, but it's not, it's, it's, it's like giving away the idea that, you know, he's doing this because he has to, not because they're, you know, they're glorifying it. It's, it's a necessary thing he has to do to complete his mission. It's not like they're making it out to be like this grand act of badass. It's, it's just what he has to do. Yeah. Um, also like the world is better off without those people at the same time. So you oh, don't yeah. feel bad yeah. about it at all. Exactly. You know how easy it would be to edit that scene to just give him a lightsaber. Do you know how easy that would be with the way he's fighting and the way he's taking <laughs> yeah. people out to just edit in a lightsaber instead of the machete? Yeah, we got to talk about just how fucking awesome Denzel. There's, there's so much of Denzel's performance that you can't appreciate until you know the twist and you go back and watch it again because there's so much like nuance to the way that he goes about those fight scenes. It'll just like blow your fucking mind when you watch right. it again. Goddamn. Uh, before we get to that, though, I also want to talk about just like feeding into how dark the storyline is with Gary Oldman's character. Like, Oh my God. Gary Oldman is always, when he's a villain, he's always scary, but he's fucking scary in this movie. He's such a, just a, but, but he's also just never crossing that line of becoming like a cartoonish villain. You know, he's always it, some, you know, he's not, you know, like a mustache twirler. He's always until he's the very end in control. Carnegie is if Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg was not a cartoon, right? Yeah. Like, he uh, is every bit as evil as he was as Zorg, but not comedy. <laughs> like, he is fucking scary, and he's off his rocker. And I always remember this being one of his most terrifying performances that he's ever given. I didn't remember so just good. how scary he can be because not only is he like scary and clear the bad guy, but he like the way you go about it early on when you first meet Carnegie, uh, where he's real manipulative and real like threatening and a little bit of like a uh, double speak and stuff going on where yeah. he's just kind of like calm, like nothing matters to him because he's untouchable. Um, that's the part of the performance I always forget about because yeah, I always it, remember later when he's just obsessed. It's really interesting because there's, there's a lot of like subtlety to it, you know, just like with Denzel, you know, like the, the two, the two main characters, essentially, you know, there's a lot of subtext going on with their characters and, and, it, and it's just how much they can elevate the movie. Like they could not have been chosen more perfectly. Like you could, and, and you know, they're, they're fairly picky with what they do too. So they saw something in the script that they could elevate too, uh, or they wouldn't have taken it. Yeah, yeah, because you know they're they're not like Nick Cage. You know they won't show up and do like literally fucking anything over a weekend <laughs> to just get an Twitter ID credit. account. Um, exactly. Yeah. No. Uh. So one thing that I that I always forget about, and it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, is how like the shampoo scene. Yeah. And then we immediately cut to he's gonna send Solara. It's and, dude, and, and this yeah, it, this movie has moments that will make your skin crawl. And, but he, the casual way in which he talks about it, like he never even gave it a second thought, even though she's essentially it, his adoptive daughter. You know, it's about it's just time so I got better use out of her. Oh, it's so dark, dude. Oof. It's it, it just makes your it makes you want to go like fucking just drown yourself in bleach. It's it's hard to watch sometimes, but it's getting across his character and 
man, like, like when you just see what his scheme is, that he wants to get the book because he understands like the power. Which I mean, should we say is basically the entire history of the Catholic Church? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about that. Um, I think this movie does a good job because this movie very easily could have crossed into the territory of becoming incredibly anti-religion <laughs> Incred- well incredibly e- either incredibly anti-religion or incredibly pro-religion yeah but i think i think how it kind of plays like devil's advocate to religion i think is what kind of keeps it from becoming too preachy one way or the other one thing that's that what is- I, what's what i appreciate about it what i appreciate about it is because they are showing you through denzel's character like the, how it can be power for good and and they're showing through through Gary Oldman's character kind of what history allowed religion to do. You know, like, they're, they're not even sure. And I like also, just a side note, how they never really go into detail about what caused the apocalypse, and that makes it more the always flash. more interesting. When you just allude to stuff that, you know, it's almost like a, like a myth. It's no one really knows what happened. I'm glad they don't go into, like, the nitty-gritty detail of what happened. But, you know, just that they have, like, the idea that, like, religion might have been the cause of, the like, the Third World War and the apocalypse, pretty much, you know, but no one really knows. Not to be a downer, but given what year this came out, does that, like, kind of elude a little bit to the fact that 9-11 led to a nuclear holocaust eventually? Yeah, you know, it's it's tough. What makes me say that is they talk about the war and they talk about the flash, meaning the nuclear holocaust. But then the line about some say that the Bible is was the cause of it all. Yeah, because they, they, they talk about how specifically after the apocalypse, you know, pretty much began. But a they year or two specific, after. They specifically were rounding up Bibles to burn them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's really interesting to me because, you know, as I was rewatching this, I was questioning. I was thinking back to the to what the way I originally had watched it twelve years ago, you know, however long ago it was, you know, as far as whether or not the religion aspect bothered me, because you can have movies, I think, that go too far in one direction as far as being pro religion or anti religion to the point of being annoying and kind of preachy to the audience. But I think this movie does a good job of showing you the good and the bad. And specifically because of what, like the what Denzel talks about at one point in the movie, where he's talking about how he got too absorbed in his mission instead of understanding instead of understanding what his ideals were supposed to be focused around. And I think that's a really important part of it too. Even the hero got that, it wrong. That you know that he got lost in the mission instead of what the ideal should have been at the at the beginning of the movie, and by the end of it, understands where he had gone wrong. So even in your in your, in your protagonist, you know, he has like an arc to him about his mission what and the kind of like morals to the film are going to be and i just think it's i think it's like really delicately done and you're a fucking post-apocalyptic action movie <laughs> and like, you can think, argue they, that that's part of the grand design bringing solara in because that's where he kind of realizes he was on the wrong path yeah you know yeah, yeah it's a lot of fucking depth you know there's a lot of like discussions you can have about religion or you know ideology and it's the fucking post-apocalyptic action movie with Denzel. You know, he, he, I think that's what drew Gary Oldman and Denzel to do this movie. It's it's not, it's not what you you know this this if you read what this movie could have been on paper, it could be you know like a fucking two a.m. sci-fi channel film. Yeah. But there's a lot more depth to it that I think is really interesting to talk about, and I'm glad that you know we ended up having an episode about it because you know there's especially when you rewatch it, there's a lot of depth to it. I think is really interesting. Uh, the the thing back to. Uh... What you were talking about, the thing that kind of saves the movie is it's there's an interesting Venn, uh, Venn diagram to be drawn between Eli and Carnegie because they're both kind of talking about the same thing, mm-hmm. but two different at the black and white aspect of it, right? Like the result yeah. is kind of the same. They kind of have the same ideal, the same purpose for this bible but spreading the word yeah yeah exactly but to completely different ends Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's kind of crazy i think a lot of that was lost on me the first time i watched it It it's like yeah cut his arm off (laughs) like you know (laughs) yeah yeah because it's like it's like sleight of hand because the movie visually because it's the Hughes brothers like looks amazing you know you're you're just kind of you can get you can get lost in just looking at the imagery because the imagery is so good and the set design is so like you really can feel 
how tactile the post-apocalypse feels you know it doesn't feel like a green screen really it feels um i think their color palette is really good too you know it's always kind of like overexposed a little bit where you can almost kind of like feel like the heat and the kind of you can feel you the get, sun you, beating down yeah you really do it's it's really yeah. well done the the thing that i appreciate the most is i kind of love how the apocalypse itself is not the focus of the story, so we don't worry so much about it. Like This could have easily made the mistake of, let's spend 30 minutes showing how we got to this point or why, when that has nothing to do with the plot. And there's a lot of movies that make that mistake, whereas you know this one just focuses on Eli. He's got a mission. It just happens to be the end of the world. Yeah. You know, how we got here, what caused it, that's not the point. And I think a lot of movies and a lot of stories in general, whether it be video games, TV shows, uh, which, to be fair, though, TV shows have more time to flesh things out. But movies, TV shows, video games, books, uh, sometimes kind of get lost in trying to explain the world rather than just letting the person kind of figure it out as they experience the story. And it takes a certain amount of restraint and courage to kind of just let your story feel it out. I mean, that's one of the things that I really appreciate this movie does. Yeah, it's like you have to, like, feel out the world through, like, the lens of the characters instead of it being spoon-fed to you. Exactly. And a, a, and a lot of movies, like, really, really go too far into spoon-feeding because they feel like, oh, people are going to be annoyed if, <clears throat> you know, it's like a lot of, like, not being confident in your story. Yeah, exactly. Where you think people are, yeah, it's like, you know, like, a confident writer will see, like, the people that are really diving into the movie and really understanding, like, what the point is are realizing that it's because of what the character's actions are and not the backstory of the apocalypse itself. And it's it doesn't matter, just like you said. It's what I do that defines me. Um, Yeah, uh, you know, and take everything I just said and then jump back to us covering Fellowship of the Rain talking about Kate Blanchett <laughs> doing a 30-minute voiceover <laughs> and how amazing yeah. it was. Yeah, I mean, some, sometimes it works, you know. <laughs> if For Kate, a if of Kate Blanchett years, wants to tell me how Eli ended up here, then fine. I will sit through yeah. the whole thing as Kate Blanchett yeah. tells me how we got exactly. to this point. Exactly. I think there's also like a really interesting aspect to... I, I, I really like... I really love how... Eli's approach to religion doesn't end up being the same approach that the people at the Alcatraz library are having. Yes. It's scholarly it's really, for them. Exactly. Because it makes it makes it even more interesting. Three in viewpoints on religion in this movie. Cause I love that because I, I love how Malcolm McDowell, uh, his kind of viewpoint with them creating like the library is they're viewing like religion almost as like knowledge. And access to knowledge and exposure to, to knowledge and exposure to, like, the Bible isn't inherently a bad thing. It's what you decide to do with it. It's Which like ultimately the, is the, kind of the crux of the movie. Exactly. Yeah, because cause what, what, what makes it so evil, and I'm, I, like, I'm so glad that the movie doesn't just become completely pro-religion with Eli's character, but they show you the negative aspect. Because what we have seen happen more often than not in history is what Gary Oldman is trying to do with it. He specifically wants to be able to grab the Bible and use it to take control of nearby towns because he knows that what he says can't control people. What is said in the book, the word of the book will control other people and make them fall in line. And that is exactly what has happened time and time again in history. You know, like when people talk about how it's a legend within the book of Eli, how religion might have caused the apocalypse it very well might have in their story you don't know but that doesn't because mean you know it's for... a direct result of religion it was the people using it that, yeah. like, that's that's the whole the whole thing the whole crux of the movie is kind of revealed at the end when you get to alcatraz ironically of all places and you know they're taking the scholarly approach to it and you realize that it's it's just a tool. It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. Some people use it to justify their actions, whether those actions be good or bad. Um, that's the whole the whole crux that everything here is pivoting on. And the two black and white examples of how religion can be used is Eli and Carnegie. It's so good. And just the fact that even after all Eli has done and how it pretty much becomes proven that he did have divine intervention because of how... This is how the story unfolds. 
Right. For it just to end up becoming the book on the shelf, I think is such like a beautiful ending for it. Just to kind of show It's a little Raiders of the Lost Arky in a good yeah. way. In a yeah, good in, way. in a great yeah, in a great way because it just it kind of like further drives home that point of, you know, it's not the knowledge of religion that is the bad guy here. It's what people choose to do with it. And mm-hmm. I, I think that I think it's so cool like when you break it down and you just realize like None of this stuff was necessary. This and movie totally could have existed as just a po- 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 uh, like you know post apocalyptic movie, but fucking Gary Oldman and Denzel <laughs> just be it be in a fucking action movie, but it's not. It's and like a it's like a fucking movie of ideologies, and it's just like wow. And think about what point in real life in 2010 we were at when this came out. It's a very important message for the era because. You know, like I said, this was this came out what nine years after nine eleven, mm-hmm. and you know there was the whole like jihad and holy war against like the U.S. The U.S. was going to war against the Taliban, and there was all this anti like Muslim rhetoric going on in the U.S. and across the world, and just all all kinds of of terrible things happening, and religion was at the heart of a lot of it one way or another, because there was somehow a few extremists attacking us turned into all of Islam must be bad. Yeah. And it, you know, again, it's just, it's just like any other thing. It's just like any other religion, what you choose, how you choose to interpret it, how you choose to live by it and what you choose to blame on it or blame it for or blame for it and that's the exact message of this movie and it yeah, it's and kind thought- of, it feels like a response to that era of american history yeah it it really does too and i, I like the detail that they end it by calling the book of eli you know his his you know representation of what becomes the bible you know him reciting it from memory how they call it the new king james bible because that's exactly what the king james bible is in the first place Mm -hmm. it's it's a retelling through someone's point of view you know which ends up becoming you know eli's uh kind of and the position where it's placed at the end of the uh movie it um it is placed between a quran and the what is the tanakh is that how you Mm -hmm. say it the hebrew bible I i believe so but you know the Quran is the Islamic Bible mm-hmm. that Muslims follow. So it was placed in the Hebrew. So the Bible is based on the Hebrew Bible, and the Quran is what people who practice um, Islam and you know identify as Muslims and stuff they follow that, and it gets placed right between the two. And again, look at American history at this point. In Mm -hmm. 2010, you know, and probably even, you know, earlier than that when this movie is being written uh, and then being produced. I mean, that's a message Mm -hmm. is what that is. That's a direct message. And yeah, it that is something that was probably lost on me there at the end. But we're going back and rewatching it. You know, it's it's funny because a lot of the messaging I remember watching it a lot of what we're talking about the first time, but going into this, all I really remembered was Eli kicking ass. Like I yeah. didn't really remember any of the, the lesson being taught here, but as it was unfolding, it's like, I remember this, mm-hmm. you know, but I, the one thing I definitely did not remember was the divine intervention on Eli's behalf, which was pretty cool. Man. Like just, that, just thinking back to that, like we were talking about that shootout scene when he is just okay casually, corral, sh- where he's just casually he- walking around. When he is just st- like he doesn't even fucking move for the first like ninety percent of the action sequence. Even his bullets like, that miss hit. When he shot the wall, yeah. he also shot Carnegie in the knee. <laughs> like even his yeah. shots that miss land a hit. It's so good. And you know, the uh, the innocent and the righteous weren't touched. It's all it's mm-hmm. only the bad guys that he manages to hit. It, he, yeah, he's Domino. It's, is what I'm saying. <laughs> pretty, pretty pretty much pretty much. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and like another like a uh, scene that I absolutely love that further establishes talking a lot about 
the backstory of the movie, but keeping it kind of vague and just having like little tidbits here and there instead of spoon feeding. How cool is it when she's looking through his bag when he falls asleep in the structure that they're kind of like hiding out at night in the middle of the desert in? The he, that she reactor, sees, right? That she, yeah, that, that, that she sees the the Kmart name tag that he was literally just right. a Kmart employee. You know, he's just a dude. He's, and he's no not, one talks you know, about it. It's not yeah, brought up. It, it's, it's just, just shown to you. It's just there, and she and it's it's smart too because she wouldn't have any context for that because she obviously doesn't fucking know what a Kmart is because it's been what thirty years I think they established yes. since the apocalypse happened. Yes. So she's like fascinated by just talking to him about the way the world used to be because she doesn't have a, a you know point of reference to what the world used to be because she's only ever lived in the situation they're in now. The the other lesson that you can extrapolate out from this if you want to dig a little bit deeper is too, is it's not just the way religion can be used, but also just the way history in general can be used because it is pointed out that there's not many left from Eli and Carnegie's time. Mm -hmm. They remember the world before they remember the history before and Carnegie knows how he can manipulate that history from living it and from history to use control and Eli knows exactly what he's doing because he lived it as well. So it's not even just the way that you can manipulate religion. It's the way you can manipulate history. Cause I mean, yeah, the, it's the like expression point, is the winner writes the history books, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cause at what point <laughs> does, at what point does history be, you know, potentially become legend and vice versa? Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's really interesting just in how outside of the people who were around back then, how else would they know, you know? Yeah. And, and that's another thing, too. It's like, a, and, and there's another aspect to it that doesn't even have anything to do with like religion, like what you're talking about, how like we were talking about how there is the third approach to religion and how the library at the, at the end essentially, you know, looks at it scholarly and just has it as knowledge instead of like a, like a tool. And, you know, there's a lot to think about right there because these people are so in, in mass, just so uneducated that the, to the point to where, Almost everyone under a certain age, you know, at a certain age where they weren't old enough to have been in the previous way that, you know, the world worked, they don't even know how to read. Yeah. So at that point, when you don't even know how to read and you don't have. You, you, you think ages. about, you know, just. You, yeah, exactly. You, you just think about, you know, how fragile like history is, you know, at any point, you know, if, if you remove people's access to it, it becomes myth. It becomes something that, that they. They have no way to educate themselves because there's there's nothing to you know to do it with. It's 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 like it's really interesting that just like I I like how this version of the apocalypse takes the time to kind of like really drive home how fragile history is and how fragile humanity is. And you know, these people turn to just absolute barbarism because they don't have water, they're not educated, they can't read. That's just the way the world works to them. You go out and you fucking, you know, you kill people, you steal their shit. You know, you, you barely have access to water unless you're in these like very, very certain little towns that are obviously going to be controlled by the guy who happens to have access to the water. It, it just the huge domino effect of the way the world works is, is so interesting. The, uh, the other thing, too, what exactly is being insinuated when, you know, in a world where, you know, just like the Dark Ages... Um, written text is kind of the ultimate power. Knowledge is power. Yeah. And you only have access to that if you can read. And mm -hmm. when he tells, um, when he tells fucking, um, uh, Ray Stevenson to burn the, the fiction books that were brought to him, is it that he's burning anything that's not the one he's looking for or just because it's fiction and he's looking for um, nonfiction. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, um, is is he burning anything that anyone could that he doesn't need? And then therefore, if he throws it away, someone could pick it up. And I mean, Abraham Lincoln taught himself to read. You can teach yourself to read. And yeah. at that point, he's no longer got the biggest stick. Mm -hmm. So you know, and. Another thing that displays the fact that knowledge is power, by the way, is when the, the dude operating on his leg and he stops, he's like, did you wash your hands? He's like, yeah, three times. You know, mm -hmm. because he knows like exactly what causes what. But yeah, it's just, it's an interesting thing because I was trying to figure out 
is he burning what he sees as garbage or is he burning anything that is just not useful to him so no one else can pick it up regardless of what it is? Yeah, like if there's a, you know, 0.5% chance it could make anyone more intelligent and potentially rise up to be an equal to him, it's not acceptable, so it has to be removed. He's he's it's just so obsessed with the power vacuum of like he he sees like the opportunity that lays before him because he knew the world, you know, before. And he you, you just realize, you know, just how much like control that important you know like uh figures in a church can have or like a president can have you know he understands like what what you can do in these situations where it's in it's so easy for him to take control uh, it's just it's such an interesting dynamic between him and eli and how you know like you pointed out earlier in the episode how eli kind of has the same intention but for good reasons he you know he wants to kind of use religion to give people hope and he has every right to when he knows it's fucking real Right, like the fucking the fucking voice came to him, told him where to go to get the Bible, and his fuck like when you think about okay, let's let's talk about the twists and and again like please have watched we pretty much dodged around it beforehand, but if you have not watched this movie and you care about watching the movie, please have seen it. So we're we're gonna you know reveal the twist that completely changes the way you look at the film. Eli is blind the entire time, and we just think about like just the scene when he fucking. Hawkeye's the the vulture in midair. Yes, while blind, you're just like, what? It, it's insane. It, it, and you know, like at that point, he has every fucking right to want to share the gospel if the fucking gospel is legitimate. You know, right? It's fucking guided him across the wasteland. It's it, guided him here to he can do all of this fucking shit as a blind K-Bar employee. There's something to it, and he's just trying to share like the good word in his eyes of the King James Bible. If it's you know, real, does that make this the tribulation? Uh, yeah, and you can think about it that way. You know, that makes uh, the rapture a lot different than I expected. That means the good people that were taken to heaven were taken a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So now um, that puts everything he does into a whole new light. I mean, that fight scene under the overpass, the shootout Dude, at the it. OK Corral. You, and here's the thing too like we've talked about it before i think we talked about it in the mitchells versus machines episode about how once you know the twist of this movie when you go back and rewatch it you feel like such a fucking idiot right the first time you see him after the opening scene with the cat when he is inside that house and literally walks across the room and bumps his thigh into a table because he can't fucking see him just like dude Holy shit. How did I not pick up on these things? When he's sliding the plates in the pantry across them to see if the sound changes or if it's just all ceramic, if it's just all empty plates, no oh, cans. Oh, man. It's fucking insane just how much attention to detail there is in, in his performance and what they're kind of showing him do, but not really... you know, In the fight sequences, so many times he is reacting to things without orienting his head in that direction. And you're just like, how the fuck did I not notice that? But you can also like take it as shit like that happens in fucking action movies. Doesn't he know? also look in the direction of the mouse before the mouse comes out of the wall? I think the so. Beginning, because he knows it's coming. Yeah. Oh my god, it's it's fucking it's, again. It's insanely He's daredevil good. is what we're saying. Pretty much, <laughs> it's it's just insane how much detail there is to. Oh, in the totally different way you view the scene when he's talking to gary oldman's uh i don't think they ever talk about if they're married but the blind lady she is described his... as his mistress i think yeah on wikipedia but that whole scene you know when she walks in to deliver him food and he realizes she's blind you know you look at that in a he completely different way dog tags yeah like you look at that scene in an entirely different way when you realize he's also blind and Man, it's just, it's such, a, and like, I don't know anyone that figured that twist out. I don't either. Like, it's it's just one of those things where. It, it's also oddly you, a thing that I never, uh, I don't, I never really hear anyone spoil it. Like, when you talk about this movie, mm -hmm. it's not a thing that comes up. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't, I, it's, it's kind of interesting. Of course, I do know a guy that still holds that. No, he's. He's not blind. He just knows Braille inexplicably. As if, you know, 
that scene where they zoom in on his eyes to show that they're cloudy. It doesn't exist. Exi- right. You know? Yeah. yeah. Like, they're, that's literally there to show you that he's been blind the entire time. I, I want to say and, he and, explained that by, like, he's blind by the end of the movie because of the sun. Oh, that's... And I'm like, so in a course of weeks or months, not the 30 years he's been walking west? Also, uh, the just the idea, like... The divine protection is there to let him last long enough after being shot in the stomach, you know, to last as long How as he does. How happy were you? I was very happy. He gets shot in the stomach and doesn't die for like weeks. Yeah, it's like Gary Wood. It's like he wrote it just for me. I'm just like, thank you, dude. Thank you. <laughs> you know, one of the tropes that annoys me the most is people getting shot in the stomach and immediately fucking dying, even though it just never happens. Just killing over. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fucking annoying. But yeah. Hey, uh, I'm not I'm not gonna say what it is because it's not the movie we're covering, and I don't want to talk spoilers about it. But one of my most hated tropes, uh, they do right by me in the Eternals. Oh, you saw the Eternals? Yeah, w- uh, we watched it uh, the other night. Interesting. It's on uh, Disney what did, Plus. What did you think of it? Out of curiosity. Yeah. Yeah, Aurora and I watched it and did not like it. <laughs> yeah, it's I didn't dislike it. I didn't like it. I don't really feel like I saw anything. I was specifically irritated at that movie. Uh, and this is not really a spoiler. They barely did anything interesting with the fact that they could have shown them in any point in history. Yes, I know. Like, what the fuck are you doing? There's so much. Why not show them during, like, the plagues of the Middle Ages? Like, why are you showing them doing absolutely nothing in Babylon? Who gives a flying fuck if they were in Babylon? Yeah. It's, like, really, really bad writing. There's a lot there's of missed a opportunities. Miss, yeah, yeah, there's, like, missed opportunity, the fucking movie. Kishore it, it really fr- on, uh, on Tested said it best when he said it would have been better served as a Disney Plus series because they would have had yeah. more time to flesh things out. But yeah, they, they do, like, one fucking thing that's interesting in the entirety of the, like, the, also, it's way too fucking long. Barely anything happens, and it's two and a half hours long. Go yeah, fuck yourself. For no I'm sorry. reason. Yeah, it's bullshit. But yeah, but to, I, to I'm, back trying up, to, I'm trying to think of anything they did interesting. I don't remember them doing anything. Yeah, but that could be... I, I could talk about What's how... What's the guy I can never say his name? Uh, Kamel Nanjiani. Yes, that's all I had to say, and you knew exactly who the fuck I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, He's by far my favorite character, though. Oh, oh, and the fact that he isn't in the third act. Go fuck yourself. The yeah. one cool character isn't involved in the third act. Go fuck yourself. But yeah, I don't <laughs> like that movie. Actually, what's interesting, I would potentially like to do a side uh, comparison because this, and this is completely off topic. We'll get back to Book of Eli here. What? Oh, that's off topic. That never happened. Screenplay Tangents. That's the name of the show, right? That's what we named it? Wasn't that what we named it? Uh... I think we named it, though. Um, so... Aurora and I have been going back to watch What If. Okay. We st- we stopped in the middle of it because they get to a Doctor Strange episode and Aurora didn't really remember Doctor Strange. And we just started watching again this week. I would like to do a podcast episode, potentially if you're up to it, of the Eternals and Doctor Strange and what to do and what not to do in an MCU movie. <laughs> because watching Doctor Strange immediately after the Eternals, I'm like, how did Kevin Feige approve the Eternals? Because it's bullshit. Like, there's a lot of it is just amateur hour shit. I'm just like, what is happening? Why, first of all, don't have a movie with a crawl if you're not Star Wars. What the fuck are you doing? What was that? <laughs> what the Chris, fuck are you doing? As soon as we got to that, Christine was like, this isn't Star Wars. Uh, what, like, what the it's fuck? It's funny, okay, you made the exact same thing that she said. Let's get back to Book of Eli, though, because I actually would like to potentially have at least like a little mini sort of that, because I would like to rant about how bad the Eternals is. I still want to do yeah. MC University. Uh, I think that name was taken, no, but it was such a good name. it was name. such a good name. It was such a good name that, it, of course, it was taken, but kudos to you for the coming up with that name. Uh, it was I finally named something. Well, fucking the original name for this show was taken, and that I didn't think that would ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. But yeah, Book of Eli. Much better movie than The Eternals. Just throwing that out Oh there. my God, so much. Yeah. Uh, just when you watch the movie again, and they just couldn't be more fucking obvious that he's blind and the fact that you miss it every time the first viewing makes you feel like such a colossal fucking idiot and i love that because like one of the things i hate about movies is i often since i fucking analyze them like a goddamn nerd i figure them out like halfway through and like ruin the ending for myself so the fact that, that this one's just on com- you bro <laughs> just the fact that this completely threw me for a loop the first time i watched it and i didn't see the twist coming at all love it absolutely love it for that also i like that 
There are moments of humor peppered in just from Eli's personality. Like, yeah. you know, like, it's not, it's not a particularly uplifting movie, but you know, it still breaks a lot of moments of tension with just a tiny bit of humor, just from one off lines from Eli. My favorite one, the one that sticks out in my mind was we're going to make it through this, Solara. The voice in my head is telling me that. And then <laughs> Eustace and Muriel is on the other side of the house. Like, well, what about us? Didn't say nothing about you. <laughs> and, yeah. And then oh, like, also, immediately one... Muriel dies, like right after that. Oh, and not, not only that, she gets fucking destroyed by a rocket launcher, dude. Well, like, the fucking Gatling gun. The, yeah, the Gatling gun, dude. It takes Holy out fuck. fucking uh, Dumbledore. Dumbledore. I like too when they're trying to figure out if uh, if Eustace and Muriel are, are evil or not, and then they realize like that they're it's like oh we have to go immediately. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the dude, way they try to sneak out of the house is very funny. Something that I pointed out to Christina is in the movie when he wants to show them the cemetery for no reason of all the people <laughs> they've killed. Um, her Muriel's reaction is not oh don't show them that it's don't show them that yet. Yeah, they're so weird, dude. What? Also, did you did you notice that that's Michael fucking Gambon? That's Dumbledore. Yeah, that's Eustace? why. I, that's why I mentioned yeah. Dumbledore. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Also, can we just can we just talk about Carnegie saying go check the back of the TV and dudes like the what? Like, oh. <laughs> like God yeah. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I'm surrounded by assholes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I knew it. I'm surrounded by assholes. <laughs> oh God, this movie is so good. I also love like the, um, the like the little like moments of He's an brand recognition. <laughs> the, the little moments of brand recognition that just kind of like drive home the fact in the fucking post apocalypse when you just see like the Kmart logo, you know, like on his badge and stuff like that, and how it just has no context for anybody because right. it, it means nothing to them. You know, it's inter inter interesting how it is fucking like product placement but interesting product placement when you just think about how like those fucking people when they see gary Oldman's megaphone that says motorola on the side they don't know what the fuck that means you know they don't I even mean, know to read i don't know what you're talking about jeff i've never wanted Krispy cream donuts more in my life <laughs> than after watching power rangers oh god i love that bit of that movie so much so fucking good that made so many people mad but i actually kind of loved it because it wasn't like they did it like with ten different brands, like the whole third act is about a Krispy Kreme. <laughs> I thought it was genius, dude. I thought it was Marina Repulse funny as well. is just sitting in the middle of Krispy Kreme eating donuts. Yeah. Uh. A, a side note: It's like uh, when we were talking about the fight scene when they're holed up at uh, their at Eustace's house. <laughs> this movie has a Nowhere. lot of really cool. This movie has a lot of fucking cool transitions. Like I like the way they transition like through bullet holes and stuff. Yeah. In the vehicles and out of vehicles into the house. Uh, yeah, there's that a really surprised fucking... me because that's kind of before we started doing this. Yeah, and it's just like fucking the Hughes brothers, dude. Like, it makes me think about like the 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 scene from From Hell that I think of the most is because of their directing and the, their camera work. Do you remember in From Hell when Jack the Ripper is attacking uh, the the woman in the street, but all you can see are like the hints of light reflecting off of the blades? I watched that movie like 20 years ago. I still remember that fucking scene because like. They know how to set up like a fucking visual, dude. Yeah, I oh my can't, god, I can't recall. It's been too long. Yeah, like I'll, I'll try to find that scene for you, but like once you see it, I think you'll remember it because it's just like, man, it's a fucking good shot. And, and they, they they really get like, I wish they had worked more because at the very least they need to be doing more cinematography because like everything just looks amazing. There's this really cool transition shot too. You remember when they're dry? Uh, I think it's I think it's a shot of Gary Oldman's crew when they're driving along the highway. And it's like a sideways shot of the highway where the road's only like the ten percent of the screen on the right side, and it like pans. Yeah, it's like these like these little transitions that would be nothing to other movies. They would just have a standard transition shot, but they're like, no, fuck that. Let's have a cool shot, you know, just because we can. And I like that. Like, like just the uh, cinematographer it's, it's is Don Burgess, and he did. Um, well, apparently, he's doing Masters of the Universe. Uh, when oh, that, okay. When that comes out, but um, he did the Muppets apparently, but he did Source Code. Um, Love that movie. I still need to see it. 
Um, yeah, I'll, but, I'll probably pick it for the show at some point because you need an excuse to watch Force Cutters. It's really fucking cool. Apparently, the Polar Express, Christmas with the Cranks, Limp Biscuit behind Blue Eyes, what <laughs> Terminator Three: Rise of the Machines, Spider Man, Castaway, Contact, um. That's crazy. Night Trap? He did Night Trap? The man deserves an Oscar for just Night Trap. Oh, my God. Anyone that doesn't know what Night Trap is, I hope it wasn't a Patreon video. Look up Rage Select playing Night Trap. It's the best, like, 30 minutes he'll spend all week. Oh, it's my crazy. God. Uh, da -da -da -da. That's all I know. Yeah. So, interesting. Um, interesting that it was so... Uh, this movie is so kind of weird for its time, but not a lot of huge like monster hits. Yeah, it's it's very ahead of its time because those kind of like art film transitions, you know, like Ari yeah. Aster does those a lot. You know, P you know, it's 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 become like just the mainstay of like if, if you don't have like interesting camera work when it's not necessary, like you're not you're almost considered like you're not trying nowadays. Yeah, it's interesting uh, just how. And it's unfortunate, too, because when you look it up, this movie has a 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. And I, and I look at that score, and I'm just like, you yeah. don't understand what you're fucking watching. I saw that. Like, and that's even lower than what it had, uh, according to Wikipedia, down in the reception section here. Uh, they're not saying what year uh, this was, but 46% of 207 critics. Gave it a 5.5 5 out of 10. 30, it's really disappointing. 33 I, on Metacritic. Even if you don't end up, you know, fully being on board with the movie, I think you got to give it props for just attempting to do, like, the type of story that it does. You know, like, it, it doesn't have to try. Like, it, it really bats above its weight class. You, you know? Also, uh, uh, something we haven't touched on is Eli is a biblical name, by the way. Mm -hmm. I believe a priest, but it's been a while. There's also some really fucking cool posters. I don't, I don't know if you looked up the posters at all, but I just happened upon some of them on IMDb in the photos. There's some really cool ones where there's one that shows Gary Oldman's character and it says religion is power and Eli and the word religion is highlighted. And there's one that shows Denzel and it says deliver us and Eli and deliver us is highlighted. That's some pretty fucking cool poster work, I think. I love shit like that. Yeah, me too. But yeah, I think uh, I've kind of touched on everything I wanted to touch on. Uh, anything else that was jumping out to you that you want to talk about with the movie? Uh, not really. I think we've pretty much uh, covered everything that I had. Uh, oh my God, there's some really weird shots in here in uh, IMDb. I got to um, this picture of Denzel. The next like three pictures are all of him from a slightly slightly more to the right so it's like someone's taking like a 3d model of his head or something in these pictures as you click through them you're just slowly mm -hmm. going around his head they do the same thing to gary oldman later as you're clicking through here yeah but uh um, there's also another poster just since i was talking about them there's one from mila kunis's character that says believe in hope and the eli and believe is highlighted nice that's really that's fucking cool i, I like that that concept for their posters yeah that's, uh, that's it's, pretty it's good. like it's one of those things where it's like I get really, really bored when almost in the entirety of posters becomes like the MCU. Let's col yeah, the other MCU posters of let's collage all the fucking character profiles into a picture, and it's, and it's so fucking boring. Like this is so much more interesting to me. We like if you just take the time to kind of because they're kind of conveying like the theme of the movie. You know, remember the Dark Knight poster they're campaign? Trying. The I believe in Harvey Dent and all that. Those oh, were yeah. pretty good. And yeah. like uh, Harvey Dent's face was half silhouetted in one so of them. So good. Oh my god. Uh we didn't even touch on um like Tom Waits being in this and Yeah, he's he's uh he has some funny scenes. Like I like I I like when he flips the gun on him, you know, and yeah. hands it back to him and you know Tom Waits is just like, So you do you don't trust me, do you? Uh he's like, Yeah, I'll stay here. I'll wait here. <laughs> I'll yeah. wait here. Uh but so yeah, Tom Waits, we mentioned Michael Gambon shows up. Um Evan Jones is one of those faces that He's eminently recognizable, but I can't tell you a goddamn thing that he's in. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, he's just he's just one of those guys that's in a ton of stuff. 
but oh he's apparently in guardians of the galaxy volume two and now that i i think i can remember he's one of the like the ravagers or whatever they're called the ravager dudes yeah i think yeah. he is because he, he he just has such a distinguishable face and he, he was a good pick for one of the um uh, hijacker dudes for this i think yeah he just has a very very distinguishable i can't think face. of the ravagers this wasn't this wasn't his character but i can't think of the ravagers without thinking of taser face taser your face. name is taser face did no, you watch just, the um did just, you watch what if uh, I, w I think the last one we saw was the Doctor Strange one. Well, uh, in the the Black Panther slash Guardians of the Galaxy uh, yeah, one, yeah, I think yeah. they had Taser face back in. I was like, yes, fuck uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> I just like, I just imagine you getting up in the morning and look in the mirror and be like, you know what's a good name? Taser <laughs> face. <laughs> Love it. Is Rocket Raccoon Bradley Cooper's best performance of all time? Probably. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> I mean, he's had some uh, fucking good ones, but I mean, can you name a better one? Like, I can't. <laughs> oh my god! So what, 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 um, what do you do when you took his legs? Is he like all hobbling around and stuff? <laughs> oh, I'll get that arm. <laughs> yeah. Oh god damn love it! I love Rocket. Love it. Yeah, I, I, I love this movie. I, I liked it even better on you know. I, I think I've watched it like, like you said, like probably a couple of years after the release of the theatrical the run and everything. But it's been so many years, and it's just one of those movies where it's like. Man, I appreciate what they were going for. Even if not everything lands to some people, you know, like we talked about how like disappointing the, the Rotten Tomatoes score is. But like, man, they were trying something with this. You got to give them props for that at the very least. Like, it's amazing movie... that it scores so everywhere because anyone you talk to about this movie loves it. I haven't met anyone that hates yeah. this movie. Everyone I've ever talked to, uh, e even as far as like a lot of the pod, you know, not even just like friends of mine, but people on like podcasts, is it seems to have a much better maybe it's just because we're part of the cult following you know i, I don't maybe. i don't know but it really feels like this movie over time you know stuck a landing with at least an audience you know it's it's, it's one not of those one i'm gonna watch again soon though because like i said it's not the most uplifting it's hard yeah it, in, in many scenes it's hard to watch but it, it, it also is it's for it's it's not unnecessarily gratuitous for no reason but they it's are also trying kind to... of the way like it, it's its message is trying to be hopeful but it immerses itself so much in like the dark side of human nature for so long that it's just kind of like i'm good for a little bit i will revisit it eventually what? but i'm good for a little bit and, and what i love about its message like, kind of like to your point is its ultimate message is 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 hope but it's not naive about hope exactly it, acknowl it acknowledges the how how barbaric people can be when they see what tools can be used to get them more power or more control and that is a very very human thing and it is it is relevant to all of history and and, and it's one of the things that makes this movie cuz you know that like I talked about earlier this movie easily could have gone the route of religion's amazing you know Eli is amazing just cuz he's a protagonist it's Denzel but they they remain neutral he's stick to the point <laughs> Yeah, right. They they remain neutral in its ideals to keep it from becoming too naive about like the reality of how people can be, you know, because it happens all the time. It happens every single day. People can be amazing. People can be awful. And yeah, I, 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 better, I just this. Who better to exemplify awful than Gary Oldman, by the way? He's he's so good. Oh, he's so good. He's one of my favorite all time actors for a reason. And, and, man, man, I cannot tell you how happy I and I still need to watch The Darkest Hour. But I was so thrilled when he finally got recognized with the Oscar. I was like, what the fuck? How did it take Gary it's Oldman good. until like twenty? It's good. That's it, great. Because I've been good. I've been wanting to watch it forever. I, <laughs> I don't know why it was never... funny. It's good. That's great. <laughs> like, I don't know why that made me laugh, but it did. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, I I I adore that man, and was so happy to see him finally get recognized with, the, with an Oscar. Because man, like Gary Oldman, never a bad performance. Never. never doesn't matter. He's he's just a fucking tour de force, and like every fucking like his character in the Fifth Element should not fucking work. Does it work one thousand percent? He just makes it fucking work. That you know? character does not work unless it's Gary Oldman. It, yeah, one thousand percent. I mean. Come on. Remember that time he uh, hijacked Air Force One and Harrison Ford <laughs> had to bring him down? Come on. Get off my plane. I want Harrison Ford to tell me to get off his plane. And I will happily get off because he crashes it so often being high on weed hey, all hey, the hey, time. He fucking told himself to get off his own plane that one time. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> 
And hey, on that hey note, you've I scored think... a hole in one. You can crash into a golf course and walk <laughs> away from it. So that's because he approached the golf course at light speed, dude. I mean, <laughs> what was he gonna do? We can't stop. <laughs> it's too dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> what's the matter colonel sanders chicken chicken god why are we not just why is this show not just covering space balls every single week because we can make that work i would watch it every week i wouldn't get tired of it it doesn't look druish <laughs> oh my I'm god i'm a bog half man half dog i'm my I'm own, my best, own friend. best friend <laughs> genius radar yeah. about to be jammed i watch the beeps i watch the creeps i watch the sweeps the what the what and the what Oh God! <laughs> is any movie as quotable as Spaceballs? No. I don't think so. I don't think it's possible. You've captured their stunt guy. doubles. <laughs> you idiot! <laughs> You've captured their stunt doubles. I can't even quote it. I can't. The scene where they're trying to fast forward through the tape, and then they run across the scene they're in now. Oh my God! <laughs> Prepare to fast forward. Fast forwarding, sir. <laughs> if for some reason you have uh, stuck with us to this point. I'm sorry, no, no, but no, also, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to follow us more, uh, please follow us over on Twitter at SPR Filmcast for show updates. Uh, also, ratings and reviews would be a huge fucking help for us because that's yes. really the only way that small podcasts can grow nowadays because there's just a fucking metric shit ton of them. So yep. word of mouth and reviews does wonders to help us grow. If, if you know just one other person you think might like the show, please share it out. We really, really appreciate it. Five star reviews and, always appreciated, but be honest. I mean, any any review, to be honest, helps. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like you know, bad publicity is still good publicity for the the way the fucking algorithms work. The algorithms don't care; they just see that there is activity. They don't care if it's good or bad. <laughs> we can't recommend this; it's too dangerous. <laughs> Uh, Ron, when you're not uh, quoting Spaceballs in the Book of You Light podcast, where can you be found online? You can find me on Twitter and YouTube at RonSense TV. There you go. And Ron, what is the next episode going to be? Well, Jeff, I was uh -oh. thinking about that. And February has a particular holiday. Okay. I was thinking that my pick comes out in just enough time for people to have gotten through Valentine's Day, probably. So yeah. I picked my favorite uh, romantic comedy of all time. Oh, shit. Okay. I'm picking Deadpool. Oh, wow. There you go. Did that movie come out on Valentine's weekend? It did, because it is oh. literally a romantic comedy is what it's trying to be. There you go. Yeah. It's great. And I, I haven't seen it. it in a while. Far too long. Yeah. And Deadpool's I've been great. looking for an excuse to uh, work it in somewhere. And then I was there thinking, I think my pick is shortly after Valentine's Day it releases. Yeah. And I think we're also, uh, I think we talked about potentially March being the next Friends and Family Month where Ron and I do not pick the shows and we have double the shows, which is always fun. Yes. Probably probably some of my favorite time doing this show was the Friends and Family Month, you know, because we just Dragon like, Ball yeah, Evolution. Of, yeah, yeah. I mean, can you top the cinematic masterpiece? <laughs> That was Dragon Ball Evolution. I think not. I'll wait. Uh, the fly. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. But yeah. I, so uh, I think we're probably going to uh, call it that. But yeah, I mean, pretty much everyone I assume has seen Deadpool. But just know we will be going into spoilers. So if you are the one person in the fucking universe that hasn't seen Deadpool, please watch it before we talk about it. Because Ron and I will talk about fucking everything. Yep. Especially if in no that other... movie. I love that movie. Yeah. The... the uh, the first Deadpool is fucking amazing. And it's got an yeah. interesting... Uh, it found an interesting fight to get made. We're going to have to talk about that. Oh, yeah. It's it's fascinating just how much they had to you know, fight tooth and nail to get that movie, which is now like one of the most beloved comic book movies in the last several Didn't years. Didn't it hit a billion dollars or something? It, it hit something where it was... Just, and it was an R-rated movie. Like, we, it was we an R-rated comic book movie. Like we'll and we'll talk about it. Mainstream like, you don't get, comic book movie. You, you don't get stuff like Logan and the Suicide Squad unless Deadpool makes fucking one billion dollars. You know, like so we Dude, we, a lot we don't get Spider Man's fucking eyes without Deadpool. Like Deadpool True, gave yeah. us so we, much. We have a lot to talk about the Book of Deadpool next. Uh, you know, the next episode is <laughs> gonna be fun. Dude, oh <laughs> my god, the it's one of those pivotal movies like we talk about every once in a while, like Batman eighty nine and. Iron Man. Batman Begins. Batman Begins. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun. 
can't wait to have an excuse to, uh, to revisit it. So, yeah, we appreciate you listening, and you guys have a good one. Sorry, I'll be right back. I've had to go pee for like 30 minutes. So I'll be back in a second. <laughs> All right. I'll be right back.